Hello, hello, hello. Episode 28 of the football pod of Paddy and Andy. That was kind of, I was kind of warming up for Christmas there, boys, with a bit of a <laughs> oh, 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 intro. How are we doing? How are we getting on? All's good. All's good. My side, uh, yeah, good week. It's like, Paddy, like, the, the bloody Mayo final's on this weekend. Andy Moore didn't make it. The Dublin final's on this weekend. You didn't make it. What are we supposed to talk about this week? Don't expect me to be at that final anyway. Andy, that's corner. I thought you would have been throwing the ball in at the Mayo final. No, I have different priorities now, Patrick, I'm afraid. I was down watching Ballon more against Mount Bell. Well, I thought you'd be doing something with the book at that final. No, no I'd have been selling it again if I was able. But I, I, <laughs> you I, made the right call. And books from yeah. Andy Moore. Before yeah, we, 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 we players to look at down in Ballon They played really, really well, actually. Um, Ballon did it. Yeah, a couple, of, a couple of standout performances and Michael Daly uh, for uh, Mount Bellew had about eight, nine shots, but just for a period of 15 or maybe seven, eight minutes in the second half was just Hit the groove. A different, on a different planet, lads. For a in week. the zone. Uh, it, 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 honestly, he, he missed one or two in the first half, but he kicks this bomb off his left foot at the, in the second half and then boom, he was just gone. I get him going. Like. And he just goes and he, 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 he got three, but he actually kicked four, but one was pulled back for a 13 yard free and he was just outstanding, put them a point head. Valdemore kept going, they had a chance in the last minute or two. Last, last play of the game, Tom Pryor was outstanding and a chance, but just fell away from them. But Valdemore were, were really, really good. It was a great game. Good signs. Was there a good atmosphere down there? Oh, really? Unreal. Really? See, what, what people don't realise about Leitrim and what I'm kind of learning fairly quickly is that if you look at Division 3, Division 4, right through, they're the only real county where they're nearly 100% Gaelic football. There's no soccer, there's no hurling. Yeah, so there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's still mad Gaelic football. It was something that I didn't really comprehend going down into the... But, like, they are mad. Like, when Ballinamore were on fire in the first half, they went 2-5 to 5, 2-6 to 6 up. The place was rocking. It was brilliant, you know? You picked the right game to go to because... Not more of one back to back Mayo championships now, but it was let's call a spade a spade. It was a drab enough affair, one nine to six <laughs> points. And I don't know, like I know, I know not more missing one of their best players in, in Darren McHale at the minute, but they got the job done. And then over in Dublin, <laughs> after 20 was follow, minutes, I was following this on Twitter, like I was at the rugby with, with, with the rain, and uh, I was actually had, had dinner with Mannion on Saturday evening, and we're chatting about the game. And like, did you cook? Did, <laughs> did I fuck no. <laughs> he, he had a game the next day he got food poisoned otherwise now um, we're just chatting and Jude's to be fair and he would have seen it yesterday in the game they've been knocking on the road they've never won it but yeah. that team has been on the road for about 10 years they've been in a couple of finals before and semi-finals and they're, they're just so hard to play against They've always been in the mix, and that team is like a lot of those players have been together for that whole period of time. So I'd say there was a lot of goodwill. Well, I know there was that f- from outside of Jude's that it would be great to see them finally win. A very similar to what what Mayo might have went through that they've been so close and so many times, but just haven't been able to get over the line. And they're just really hard to play against. But like I wasn't surprised that it was a. a Dour enough game and it was low scoring. That's what they're good at. And then they've guys like Kev Mack, obviously, and some other tidy forwards who can clip scores. They're really well organised, physical, fit, hard to play against. Mm. But I was still surprised when I was checking Twitter and there's 25 minutes gone and it's nil all. I was like, Jesus Christ. I thank God I didn't go to it. Um, but even then, it looked like they'd, they'd nicked it and they'd get over the line. But to be fair to Croaks, they pulled it out of the bag towards the end. Nearly, Manu, it was nearly Manu like they were waiting to go. It was nearly like they were they were yeah, waiting for it to happen. They cooked before. The Croaks obviously they're the most famous. We came Mackey on last week, and it didn't go well for Mullinock to this weekend. But no, that was one of the biggest upsets in recent memory in, in, in the whole club scene. With Mullinock to beat and McCord in the Leinster club final in Parnell Park a couple of years ago. So Croaks have been caught before, probably underestimating uh, opposition. And they would have been favourites to win that game, obviously. A lot of particularly after how they, they kind of dismantled Bally Bowden in the semis, everyone was kind of tipping. Mm. Like maybe their their hearts were saying that they'd like Jews to win, but the heads were saying Croaks are gonna win this by, by four or five points. And they were blessed to get out. But to be fair, Mannion stood up and, and he's been he's been the best player in, in, in the club championship. And everyone's spoken about that and the focus on potentially going back with Dublin and things like that. But 
he kind of dragged them back into it. Keane O'Connor got a great goal coming from wing back. He's been on the Dublin squad as well. Previously, he's an excellent player. And ultimately, Jude's just, just could not get it done in the end. And I know out of all the defeats they've had, that will be a particularly hard one to take. Um, because it couldn't have really, they were five points up in the second half. And they're thinking of all the teams, because they're so well organised, and like you say, they're so experienced, they'll be kicking themselves that they didn't see that out. Because they're, mm. they're not a team that give away easy scores or, or could yeah. do anything really silly. So to lose it from that position for them, have never won it before. It is. It's, oh, it's, hard it's, it's heartbreaking yeah. for them, but, but it's a massive win for Croaks and it kind of catapults them forward. You always say, maybe this is right there. If you win the Dublin Championship, you've got all the momentum going into the, to the Leinster Club campaign. You're automatically one of the favourites. Croaks were great, but but that would be a big win for them and, and they obviously played the Mead Champions who you know, Tommy, in a couple of weeks' time. But and not then, a great, yeah. great spectacle. <laughs> they're subs, Paddy. Like, like that. The point to win the game is is a beautiful yeah, point. Pearson, Copeland, yeah. Co- yeah, Copeland does so well. To to like your man should have whoever it was before should have taken the mark. Yeah, and Co- Copeland does so well to push him back out. And on his left leg, just to whip it around after coming on. So they're subs that got. But uh, Andy, it's gas with a club like Crokes and Bowler are quite similar to this. There is massive depth. Yeah. Like, like you've got obviously Mannion and Rory and Carroll and Keenan Sullivan who stepped away guys you know, who are known nationwide with Dublin but a lot of those guys will have played underage with Dublin that you might never even have come across or they've never even had a go with the with the senior team or even in our World Cup squad but they've all played like minor under 21 with Dublin they've been on those development squads so like their their base level is really high when it comes to club football you might see in, in counties or smaller clubs in Dublin where you'll have the, the inter-county couple of players and then there's quite a big drop between that and maybe the weakest player on, on the 15. Where yeah. clubs like Croaks, Bowden would be quite similar. They're just massive clubs with massive numbers that even their subs will probably have played for Dublin development squads at some stage through their career. So yeah. the gap between their, their marquee players and their kind of not so well known players isn't as big, uh, and they're not relying on. We've seen it with Vincent's would have been very good like this as well, where he obviously had Connolly and and Jerry Brennan and Mossy Quinn, but their other ten or eleven players were, were really solid club players as well, and that makes such a massive difference at the later stage. It, like I say, when it comes down to crunch moments, it's not a complete novice who's getting the ball if Mannion doesn't get it, and it's like anything could happen here. There's a really yeah. good level across the team and that's why they're so successful and they have been so successful over the last decade or so is that, that depth and, and just that nearly their, their secondary players are of a really high standard as well for club level um, Yeah, you could see that yesterday and you yeah. see it with Vincent and, and the successful teams in Dublin over the last number of years they have that depth well, the Mayo well, final Tommy just on the Mayo yeah. final um, really uh, back to back for not more um, mm. without Darren mm. McHale amazing stuff and very untypical Mayo victory in terms of Dwayne Ackmore won it Dempsey was just Ray Dempsey deserves huge credit um, just really good coach and knew if Belmullet didn't score goals they weren't going to win the game and just shut it down it wasn't nice it wasn't the way they would like to play football not more they just shut the game down and just they knew that Belmullet wouldn't score enough points to beat them so they just churned it and churned it and churned it and, and got the results there. How will it, will they go? How will they go in Connacht now? Will they be favourites to win yeah. Connacht? If they turn a strand, the Sligo champions yeah. next, and Mount Belly are playing yeah. Parry Pierce as a first common. It'll be very, very tight. Uh, they have a huge really? advantage. They have a huge advantage. You could see on Mount Belly even yesterday, they tried so hard to win the bloody thing for the last four or five years. I'd say that a heavy week. And <laughs> you could see yeah. <laughs> the first half they were struggling and Balnamore were on them. And like Your Dom, Dom, being sweat out. Like. Yeah, Dom Corrigan's tactics, lads, were absolutely unbelievable in the first half. If you've seen what they did for the kickouts with Johnny Gall against Dublin 2014, like it was amazing <laughs> stuff. Class. Yeah, and they got goals from it. It was really, really, it's great to see a little bit of smartness. You know, I know that Conlon like Gilligan now helping them at times as well. Just really smart. Uh, uh, very good. Yeah, so he used to come down with Dom and help him during the week, really? I think. And it was just really, really cute football. But when Bellew got going, were, you could see that they were a decent team. Pierce, again, first time they've won in a little while. Massive. Uh, but not more of one, two, back to back. So yeah. they probably had the party last year. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. Thinking a bit of experience now. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, well, look, it, it, we, we don't have time to get through all of it. There's a there's a Club G8 uh, roundup on the Off the Ball YouTube channel from this morning, and there's a bit more right, happening we tomorrow. Got one of our, we were supposed to, our guests last week. We're not. I'm not finished yet. Like, <laughs> oh, like, chat about Mullen Octa. Mullen Octa. didn't score in the second half. The King, King of the Shock. We need to get him back on. We do. We need to get Kim Mackey back on. Blessington, the Wicklow champions, bet them sensational stuff. Your buddy, Philly McMahon, is their performance coach. Any insights <laughs> on what Philly's up to down there? Is he really? Yeah, yeah. He's, I actually read a piece in the Blessington <laughs> and GA Facebook page. Who's claiming this? The Blessing and GA Facebook page. They, they spoke about how integral Philly was to their performances this year. So Philly is developing a nice little CV there. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, the you celebration. Know that now, but maybe, maybe he is, yeah. <laughs> celebrations there were unbelievable um another guest we had on the pod a couple of weeks ago star kieran donahue oh, Jorginho. on tv oh, the winning oh, penalty he said he, afterwards he, on gave, he gave him one of those <laughs> he gave him one of those he it. Absolute it. He, had, he had lola rose in his arms after the game on, on tv and he said it's easy taking the hero penalty it's easy, hell. it's easy taking the hero penalty. You go, and then he started talking about the ins and outs of, you know, if you have to take it and if you miss, you lose. It, you know, the John Terry back in the day. So what a Can penalty. Can you imagine at 38 years of age, that's going in American. Oh, Stefan O'Comber. Wow. Ah, lads. Can you, yeah, like, I was just looking at him. I was thinking about poor old Donny running after this geezer. No, oh, pass him oh, yeah. You're pointing to the wing forward there. You're talking that's about his back. It's unbelievable. No, it was and, great. It, it was a great shout from the um from the St. Brendan's manager, you know. Like it, it was it was the right man to put on him, and he had him in the left half back position for half the game. He had Kieran back playing left half back for most of that game. Kieran's no better than that. Look, better than there's, that. Gonna be, there's gonna be there's gonna be savage, savage, savage crack and carry for the next two weeks because it's an old tree final. Yeah, it's unreal. It's Kieran Kieran Rally Rally and the last against Stacks, and but it's Brendan, also an old Brendan. Killarney relegation playoff croaks. Yeah. Who are in the county semi final are now being in danger of being relegated. I haven't a clue how it works, but yeah, that's what? that's how it's going. Yeah. But Brendan, the Brendans have a bit of Tralee in them as well, don't they? They do. They're all yeah, local John clubs around there. Them, them, them they, did, yeah. they, had a, they had a right team as well, and they were talking beforehand that eight different clubs involved. And Owen Gwale, who have an intermediate final next weekend, are one of the strongest teams there. Dave O'Cumber and Diarmuid O'Connor, and I think the Barrys are there. Jack Barry and his brother Andrew yeah, yeah. is very good. But yeah, look, really yeah, impressive yeah. stuff all weekend. Like shout out for Lockmore Castellini. They upset the odds in Tipperary bet Clonmel commercials. Uh, one of the tweets of the weekend was Shane Brophy, who said that Clonmel were raging with the referee. The free count afterwards was 27 11 against uh, against uh, Clonmel. So I don't know whether that's discipline or I don't know. Don't be giving of... out about the ref. Get the uh, job done. Don't want to hear it. A shout out to John McGrath, man of the oh, match yeah, in the draw and hurling final last week. And then he scores the winning goal this week and gets man of the match in the football final for Lockmore Castellini. Savage stuff altogether. Um, do you know there was plenty else happening? There was the the Ulster game, Glenn, Waddy Graham, um, yeah, Adiku Rourke's team edged past St. Unions in another tight dour game. And next week we know that we're gonna have Rammer of Cavan against Kilku live in the TV and Glenn against Scottstown, which is gonna be a cracking game. So that's gonna be really, really exciting. Lads, our special guest this week is a man who you both know, I'll say well. <laughs> Andy knows him very well, and Paddy knows him pretty well. Barry Solon. <laughs> Big Baza. Is that a good way of putting it? Big Barry, like he, he, he's supposed to be my, my mate, but he's more friendly with Paddy these days than he is with me. Paddy's the last, time, high the last time I seen Baza, he was, he was running after me down Camden High Street at about <laughs> one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> trying to get me back into a taxi. But uh, Were you wearing the sunglasses there. still at this stage, were you? <laughs> well, that was <laughs> your 2 a.m. first time. The shades were gone at that stage, I would say, yeah. We had a good day in London. It was the last month. One of my many trips over, Baz was looking after a couple of buddies of his who I'd be buddies with as well. We had a good old night. Um, so, yeah, I was looking forward to catching up with him again. Yeah. <laughs> Barry, before we get Barry, one of the most renowned SNC coaches in the world, on, I'd like to ask you a simple question. How did you winter? <laughs> I'll go first. Um, very poorly for a lot of us. Um, it, it, as soon as I took alcohol, as soon as I took it, I, I used to, I used to swell up, and I, like I couldn't understand it. Like and I, <laughs> I, I was never, I was never a big drinker. Like, but like, if like if I went for the one night a week session, like like the way you would in the winter, where you might go on a Saturday mm. or if you're in college, yeah, you might yeah. go on a Wednesday night or whatever. I swear to God, it used to have such a drastic effect on me, and then all of a sudden, on your weight and my, my weight, huge. Were, were you drinking? Huge. Maybe you were just drink, drinking the wrong stuff. What were you drinking? 
Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, no, no. I'd be, I'd be a beer man. But, like, like it was just, uh, like, I'd be a larger man. So it was just, uh, you know, it was just the way it went on me. And then my nutrition kind of went. So I didn't winter quite well. I used to always train through it. But, like, winter and me, I'd, be, I'd be a porky little fella on here. Even later in your career, Andy, would you have trained through the winter as well? Um, I'd have kept myself ticking. Well, he runs a gym. Yeah, he, yeah. he does. His whole business yeah. is centered around no, fair, you know, yeah. fitness. No, and really. the, big, the, the biggest change for me, even during the winter, was was my nutrition. It was okay. uh, it was learning like what not to eat. Like so, I used to like the whole carbohydrate crack doesn't work for me at all. As soon as I eat, I can. I'd look at myself here on a Monday <laughs> evening, and I'd be like. Big carb head on me, like you know. So I need to be. I need, I, I need to be careful. Carb loading through the <laughs> I, need to, I need to be. I need to be careful all the time, really. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you needed a bit of help to get on top of all that. Yeah. And Paddy, what were you like? So let's not. Let's talk post. We know what you were like pre twenty twelve. What were you like post twenty twelve in the winter? Yeah, it kind of uh, went through phases, I suppose. Well, similar to Andy, there was a definitely a couple where I would have been quite diligent about my training and stuff, even in the off. I know, for example, say after 2014 when we lost, yeah. I had an injury, I broke my scaphoid, so I kind of missed a lot. I was only coming on as a sub. I shouldn't have played it on, basically a broken wrist. But we lost to Donegal, and I know a lot of us would have been annoyed at that. So it kind of depends how your season finishes and how personally it went for you. So if you had a really good season, I definitely know in 15 and say 16, were I kind of good seasons... I just parked and just went and had the crack. Like Mick Jagger mode with the lads. Like uh, we'd won a couple of All Irelands at that time. And it was just like, you know what? It was so heavy for us through the season, not just the mm. training, but everything. It was relentless. That by the time you got to October, say, it was like, oh, you don't want to look or even think about football now. We're going out, we're going away. You, see, you know, the weekend as you, away. And, as you, you famously put it. As you famously put it, a monk for 10 months of the year and then you're the yeah. proud prince of copper Face Jacks. That way, something along those lines it wouldn't be fair But off, you wouldn't yeah. put on weight, Paddy, would you? I wouldn't say so. I, I would have put it a little bit. Um, that, that's what, I would have had a couple of years like that, maybe 15, 16, 17. Then, as I'm coming to the end, I nearly go back again. In 18, 19, I would have trained basically through the winter as well. You'd still go out with the lads and stuff like that, but... Uh, I definitely would have keep ticking over because I would have noticed then the older you get, you do start putting on a little bit more weight. I would have had a couple of knocks by that stage as well. I had a lot of back trouble and, and, and then my hips and stuff as well. So I wouldn't have been out on the pitch um, in November, December, doing like long runs or anything, but I'd definitely be in the gym. Um, I'd be doing like the bike road ski classes, all the stuff to just keep you in shape. Different, A different type of training than GA. That you're yeah. still training... You're still keeping yourself in pretty good shape, but mentally it's nearly a break f- from the GA side of things. And then maybe you do, particularly for me, I would have went kicking at least once a week. That would be the real on-pitch stuff I would have done in the off-season, just as myself and I were talking about. Just keeping your eye in because nearly as it goes full circle and you're coming towards the end of your career as I was and maybe 18, 19, you're starting to drift back out of the team and you know... The National League is starting at the end of January. And even though we'd won three or four All Ireland's in a row, I was thinking, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get an opportunity at the start of the National League. I need to be able to take it. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the lads, you know, your Paul Flynn's, your Bernard Logans and these guys who who have won so much by that stage, were in the same boat where it was like, we nearly need to prove ourselves again. <laughs> and, and whereas normally the O'Burn Cup or the first couple of National League games might not matter that much depending on the stage of your career, that could be a chance for you to, to play. So I was conscious of that towards the end. It was in the middle, I would have been, yeah, hectic enough now <laughs> for those two or three years. Yeah. Um, but that's, it's, it's dependent on the player, depending on where the team is at and depending on how the season finished for you as well. Like So everyone's probably a little bit different. Ah, oh, yeah, of course. And then they have, not everyone has is lucky to have the likes of Barry Solon working alongside him, but you're seeing it now in a lot of GA clubs and a lot of county setups naturally over the last couple of years. The emphasis and the amount of expertise Ooh. that's on offer to players around the country yeah. it just it's changed. It, it's unbelievable. Right, it's time to probably get our, our special guest on this week, lads. So it's uh, episode 28 of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. Hit subscribe and we're going to be back in just a second. All right, you're very welcome back to episode 28 of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, and we've got a very, very special guest this week on the show. 
The two of the lads are shouting that he's my friend. He's my friend. It's Barry Solon. <laughs> football friend. Football friend. <laughs> the absolute definition. Barry, let me jump straight into it, all right? You've got Poland's Euro 2012 campaign. We've got Katie Taylor at the London Olympics. You did a bit of work with Shane Lowry. You've been in with Kildare, with Leash, Mayo in and around 2017. You're the lead S&C coach at Arsenal. But most importantly, you're Andy Moran's best friend. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us. I, I, I'm, I'm usually in that seat there where Andy is probably sitting now uh, drinking a, a cup of coffee that, or tea that him or Jenny have made at this this stage of the evening. So, yeah, a bit different. Good to be here, lads. Yeah. Jenny has never made the tea in her life, so will you stop lying? <laughs> delighted. <laughs> delighted. Never ask for them, be, no, no comment on that. It's my only job. We're delighted to have you on, Barry, and uh, we, were, we were more intrigued to get you on so you could tell us all a couple of stories from Paddy's trip over to, to London a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Myself and Andy both got a FaceTime, uh, I think, that night. Andy, yours was a bit later than my one. <laughs> the only man I've ever seen wearing sunglasses in a pub. <laughs> and Bono. Me and Bono are the only two. <laughs> yeah, you have to be, a big shot to be a big shot to be wearing sunglasses inside, all right, you know? I was telling him, Solomon, the last thing I, I vaguely remember was... <laughs> <laughs> exiting the taxi and being chased down Camden High Street between herself and Dicey so uh, yeah, yeah it's, it was still quick on her feet still nimble enough now I have to say you were moving that night alright a bit left to right more than forwards and backwards but yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the boys were in good shape when I met them now I didn't see them before the game but uh, by the time we had wrapped up and, and got out afterwards the lads had a uh, a good day. I think it was 23 or 24 degrees in London that day, so Paddy had okay. the sunglasses out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was a motley crew. It wasn't just me, lads. Was no, no, we, know. With the lads. we know that, Paddy. We know that. We know that. So, Barry, it's, it's six years now at Arsenal. You're loving life in London. You're obviously in London for quite a while. You, we, we'll get back to the earlier days in London. I've got a couple of long-haired photos here where you look quite different than you do right now in <laughs> championship yeah. football back in 06. Are you loving life there now at the minute? Yeah, I'm just uh, very lucky here. Now I get to to work with a great team of people, kind of that are in the in the coaching and the medical and and the performance staff here. And we've been here a few years now. A lot of us saw so those all relationships from really from a coaching point of view and dealing with each other and dealing with the players. They've all, you know, flourished really over the last while. I think if anything, maybe the lockdown probably made those things even stronger because when you weren't together, you had to come up with ways and solutions the same as every other team and everyone else would have seen you had to figure stuff out you know on calls like this and like chasing fellas left right and centre during the day and trying to get a hold of coaches and having meetings and getting things organised and you know everyone was just worried at the time of like you know are we going to be ready or when are we going to go back and so yeah it was a very uncertain period for everyone and uh, that kind of I suppose as a coaching team then but behind the scenes that kind of pulled us all pretty much together yeah but every day the the security gates go up at work when you're driving in in the morning. You're kind of thankful and grateful that you you get to do it every day. You know, uh, yeah. one of my friends that was one of my friends that was here a couple of years ago. Andy will know him. John Ginty had a, a funny comment. Him and my brother Mike were were here a few years ago just visiting for a few days when they were with the Mayo Under Twenty Ones and. He commented that he goes, "Do you know what the best thing about this place is?" When we were walking around the training ground, he said, "There's no floodlights," and I was kind of like, "What do you mean?" He goes. You guys get to do everything like during the day because it's your job, you know. Whereas we have to, we have to do everything during the evening. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just I suppose the difference in in environments and circumstances. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, but love it every day. Jesus, yeah, dream, dream stuff. That is. Yeah, it's great, and yeah, just I'm obviously very lucky to to be here and very lucky to be in a good team of people here now. You know. And and I I I, I leave the questions to Paddy and Andy after this, but it. Working in professional sport when you were a little boy, is that something you dreamed of? Um, I wouldn't say working in, in professional sport. I knew I wanted to work in sport, but at the time in Ireland, there, I'm not sure if there was any professional athletes really when I was going to school. There might have been a few lads playing over in the Premier League, but that would have been even you know before it really kicked off. You know, So rugby would not, not have even been professional back then. So I actually, you know, I knew I wanted to do something. My initial thing was maybe to do PE teaching, but... 
I think that was higher than medicine at the time down in UL, and I definitely wasn't getting that. <laughs> you definitely. weren't getting that solid. I definitely, definitely wasn't getting that. That's so. going, no? No, no, that no, wasn't good enough for them either. Like, so I was juiced both ways. So um, so that probably, yeah, I just then doors opened then to come over to the UK, and I studied and did yeah. uh, sports sports science here in St. Mary's in, in Twickenham, and that kind of opened your eyes then a little bit more to the professional world here because a lot of the... The rugby teams that would have played England and Twickenham, they would have based themselves at St. Mary's for the week. So, you know, you'd walk out going to lectures in, on a midweek morning and it could be the All Blacks in Australia or South Africa, Ireland had been here. So you just, it opened your eyes to a different world, you know? But Baz, yeah. when, we were, when we were younger, like there was no avenue to get there. Like we had no kind of indicators. The only indicator we had was Jono, really, wasn't it? He, he was kind of with goal at that stage and we had a fairly good school team and like what you did, and I think it's very important for young people, what you did is you, you just got stuck in and you came in kind of as Jono's kind of helper, gopher, uh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. with the boys and uh, that's, how you, that's how you really got started, wasn't it? How old are you then? Yeah, uh, I was probably 17, 18. Okay. You know, the lads would have been a year or two behind me in school. There was kind of a crop there. That would have, <laughs> Three. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a crop there that would have been kind of Andy's age, a crop then that would have been my brother's age, and then my own friends. And kind of, it's kind of our club team probably developed off those kind of three or four age brackets uh, when we had a good senior team here. And uh, But yeah, as Andy mentioned there, like I, when they were uh, playing with the 80s there in Balhadreen, I would have been picking up cones and filling water bottles and doing all that with Jano and collecting goals or footballs behind the goals. And I would have went off the goal by training with him then. Then the odd time, uh, back when I was a kid, like back in the late 80s. Oh, yeah? When Mayo were in the final in 89, yeah, I would have been going after training with Jano in the evening time, collecting balls and filling water bottles and doing things like that. So, and would have done a little bit of that. Not the, just the odd time then when he got to Galway, because I was kind of moving away at the time. But I remember being up in Galway at the time for like a few weight sessions and watching a few pitch sessions and things like that as well. So he was just a great avenue for us to have there in town, you know? Andy, you had a story in the book about... Um... John are bringing you over to meet a couple of the Galway lads in 2000, wasn't it, when you were in the schools team? Yeah, 2000. I, it, 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 was just, it was just after we won that school thing and uh, I was introduced to alcohol at that stage, you know. And uh, so it was the next morning, the two senior teams and the two minor teams used to eat together the next morning, you know. I wasn't in the best shape in the world though, the next morning, you know. <laughs> and uh, John had brought me over to Michael Donlan and players like that. And it was just, it was something I had to shake myself to get myself right. I was 16, 17 years of age. But yeah, but he, he had the wherewithal <laughs> always to, uh, to, to bring us with, with him. If you showed interest around a man, he, he'd, he'd bring you with him. He kind of, he'd look after you a bit, but it was uh, like a not to blow smoke up, Baz is um, behind or anything like that, but we'll give him plenty of grief now in a few minutes. But like w- what Baz did more so than really anyone else around that time was he wasn't afraid to do it for free. He was going doing stuff. He was, geez, I, I remember you doing massage for a local team. You, you were kind of half a physio. You were, like you were, kind of, you were kind of developing the avenue what you wanted to go down. You, I, I think you were kind of caught between about 10 things there at once until you really realized, okay, this is where I want to go. This is how I want to do it. And I think going to probably to St. Mary's probably helped you in that way, did it? Yeah. And you, you kind of, you're just doing a bit of everything, really. When I finished school, I had, a, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I kind of had a year or two there where I wasn't really sure. Um, and it was actually Jono's uh, daughter, Rona, who put the idea in my head. She went over to St. Mary's to do PE teaching. And that, like, as I was kind of finishing my leave and sort of hadn't, that avenue just hadn't come into my head, you know to be able to go and do that because I'm not even sure if there was a sports science course in, in Ireland at the time. Uh, may have been one just kind of starting up in, in DCU and then there was just the PE course in Limerick. So the avenues to do that or go and do physio, like the point system at the time was was crazy. And as Andy has kindly reminded everyone there, I wasn't qualifying for any of them with me leaving cert. So uh, yeah, I went about it another route, but can, you picked up loads of skills along the way. So it ended up in a good place, you know? Yeah, it sounded like you created your own apprenticeship out of school and just kind of a rolled with it. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're all... A, come on, buddy. You know on that, lads, right? And, and I'd say f- from my own experience with uh, strength and conditioning and sports science coaches coming into teams, um, there's no doubt, like, like at, our, at our level, so, so the elite kind of GA level nowadays, the Dublin's or Mayo's or Kerry's and things like that, anyone who gets that role or, or is offered a, a role there, there's no doubt that they have the technical expertise to get there. They've usually done the masters, the PhDs, and all that type of stuff. 
Like they know what they're talking about. I find, and in our experience, we were very lucky with Dublin to have two very successful strength and conditioning coaches who were massively important to us. One was Martin Kennedy, who was there with, uh, with Jim Gavin initially for, for the first couple of years there. I think he's with the IRFU now. He left Dublin to go and work with, with the underage um, Irish rugby teams. And he was just an amazing influence for, for Jim and all the coaches coming in because that was their, he was their first SNC in, in 2013, but also on the players. Then we have Brian Cullen, who's still there now. And Cully, Cully always had credibility because he played with a lot of us. And he was, he was an all Ireland winning captain himself. But in between, between Martin finishing up and Cully leaving, we had a couple of different guys. And it just didn't work out, right? And I won't go into names or anything like that, but again, the, there's no doubt technically they, they knew what they were at. But there's another massively important aspect, I feel, for your strength and conditioning coaches, your physios, your nutritionists. I call them nearly the coaches that get the headlines are in the front view on the front line are the managers and the selectors. All the supporters know about them. The media know who they are. The players will generally lick their hole and do everything they say because they're the guys who are going to pick the team. <laughs> For want of a better word, the players have bought into everything the coaches are saying and that's the technical stuff and the tactics. But the physios, the nutritionists and the sports conditioner and strength conditioner guys are so important, particularly in modern GEA, in terms of delivering performance. Am I eating the right stuff? Am I fit enough? Am I strong enough? Am I recovering enough? How, am I available to play or am I injured? Am I not? And those guys, not only do they need to have the technical side of things, but they need to get buy-in from the players. And, and you see this, Baz, and you've gone around, you've been to loads of different teams, and this is maybe an interesting thing for you going over to Arsenal. And you need the senior players and the kind of leaders in the team to buy into what you're selling. And that not only the technical stuff is important, but you need to probably have the personality as well to go with it. You need the yeah, player yeah. to kind of go, this guy knows what he's at. He's a sound fella. And we're, we're going we're gonna to go to work for him. We're going to basically do everything he tells us to do. And we had a couple of examples with Dublin where that didn't really work. And, and, and basically, the s guy was gone in a month. Just yeah. there was a clash with the players, the personality. So even though he knows the technical side of things, the personality and nearly the, the dressing room politics can be a massively important thing. Because, like I say, selectors and coaches, they can do what they want. The players are going to do what they say because that's ultimately if they're, they're going to pick you or they're not. Whereas nearly the, select, the coaches in the background, even though they're as important, they have to probably play a bit more political games and things like that as well, Baz. And, is that, yeah. is that a hard thing to move from team to team? Because it can go wrong and you can be able yeah. to hear the players don't like it, really. Yeah, uh, and like, if, you know, someone has asked me before, like, what were, you know, real strong influences in your coaching? And I grew up in a pub at home. That's our family business, you know? <laughs> so I would say working in the pub and then we have a hackney service as well, driving a taxi. So I've done both of those things for quite a while, you know? So when someone says to me, like, is it your degree or is it your master's or your experience <laughs> or whatever? <laughs> well, not really, you know, because you have to be able to get into a room, like you said there, and be able to, to mix with the lads. And it's one thing in, in, in Mayo there or when I was with Clontar for the rugby team or in, in Kildare and Leash as well. Like, you know, they're generally lads all from the same background. Like, yeah. you know, Arsenal here is pretty much like the United Nations. You know, there's like seven or eight different languages spoken in the dressing room. There's 15 or 20 nationalities across the team. The squad is changing all the time. Yeah. Like I think I think off the squad now, uh, from when I arrived in 2015, I believe there's three players wow. that, are, that are left now. So there's that kind of a turnover. So yeah, yeah. I think when you come back to knowledge and expertise end of it, I think you're spot on, Paddy. But like it's, I think it's the old saying that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So, so when people, you know, put that interest, when, you, when people can see that you're interested in them genuinely as a human and you're not just somebody here who's like, to, you know, to shout at them and get sets and reps done or get runs done on the pitch or whatever, then you can, and coaching is all about relationships, you know, and there's a bit of give and take in all of those kind of things. And yeah, that's like, they are probably some of the, the softer skills now that really when you look at people graduating now, especially, you know, there's a, a boom in technology and sport. And some of it is great, you know, in terms of like being able to measure outputs and GPS units to look how far people run and get an idea of actually what the game is and keep an eye on people for readiness and all those kind of things. But like, 
as well as being able to like look at a computer and do all those things, you have to be able to talk to a human as well. You know, and has, that's a massive piece of it. Has your role in that regard as 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 tech changed in terms of being an SNC coach, or has just the, I suppose, the education around it? Because we've obviously experienced the boom in in say even club Gaelic football in terms of SNC. Yeah, yeah. Like there's nearly like an overload of information sometimes. It's like <laughs> there is, yeah. And like, you know, where where do I turn? Like you know, I, yeah. And I I'm the same. I kind of feel sorry for people because it's a bit like me going looking for information on a topic I'm not really aware of. Like if I bring my car down to the mechanic there, he can tell me it's going to cost. 50 quid to fix or he can tell me it's going to cost two grand to fix and I don't know the difference and <laughs> that, you know that's the same with uh, with somebody kind of trying to find a bit of, of training information whether it's online or through a friend or someone that knows someone and yeah it's it's difficult and same in the nutrition space is the same as well what's good for you on Monday is bad for you on Tuesday and you know so that's okay. where it comes to really like covering the basics and having someone that can give you a bit of advice really and you know I think the county players in clubs they've generally been, been exposed to to a good level at a county level so they can hopefully filter some of that back to, to their own clubs. And I know, you know, Martin and and, and Brian well there that, that Paddy has mentioned and they're, you know, two top class operators. And if you look across probably the last decade of, of Gaelic football, you know, Aidan O'Connell, who was along with Munster for 15 or 20 years there, was involved with Cork when they were winning the All-Irelands and all those national leagues. Uh, Martin and and... and uh, Brian, Brian were involved obviously with Dublin there as well and then Peter Donnelly is there along with Tyrone I've heard Andy, Andy mention him here so it's just no coincidence that like those teams have like a plan and they have good guys in the background and they just know how to kind of pull all those things together and like you can be like I've had loads of different titles in, in different jobs you know you're a fitness coach you're strength and conditioning coach you're a uh, head of fitness head of strength mm. conditioning lead this lead that whatever like and for me you're like you're an agony aunt kind of kind of number one, you know, and that you're, you're, you're trying to kind of keep the peace between like, you know, you get to hear what the players say that the, the management don't get to hear and you kind of get to hear what the management say that the players don't hear. So you're kind of that a little bit of a go between in the middle there. And like, if someone wants to ask me like, what's your, the, the major point in your role, it's, it's like being a good communicator to try and keep, you know, everyone moving in the one direction. And then I also think, like, you I would be, like, the head of doubt removal, you know, because all the coach wants to know is, like, are we ready? And then all <laughs> the manager, all the players want to know is, am I ready? You know, and that's where, like, the relationships you have with them and being able to explain, to, you know, technical things to them in a, in a, in a simple way that they can understand it and it gives them confidence and they can, they can go and perform then, you know. All they want to be told is you're good to go. That's it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know. And you just want to be yeah, you just don't want to be getting the way. You're in the college zone, and that's basically your whole gig. You yeah. summed it up in about 30 seconds. Yeah, you just sometimes you're you just need to shut up and that. get out of the way. You know, there's, okay. you just don't need to be heard, like, you know? Yeah, they, they, they just going back, Paz, on that uh, GPS one, I think it's very interesting. We Keen Mackey on last week, um, and he was on about, he had a famous interview before where people, he said people are gone obsessed with GPS. All they care about is the data, the numbers. They're not looking at what's happening on the pitch. Would that be something that you'd see evident in firstly in Gaelic football, but then throughout sport? Is is that something that has taken over? Has it gone over that loop, and now the the information is better than we once were getting? Uh, I think that's all down to the person that's interpreting the information or or using it and their knowledge of that. So, like you know, GPS. What would you, what, what would you use well, it for? Well, GPS is an example. That's a tool in your coach's toolbox. So uh, the first thing I would look at from a GPS point of view was like, what is the match? You know, if you're playing corner forward, what is it for you? If Paddy's playing centre forward, what is it for him? If Tommy's playing wing back, what mm -hmm. is it for him? And then I'd be looking to see does the, the, are we preparing you to play the game? So does, you know, certain portions of training match the intensity of what you're going to be exposed to at the weekend? And in simple terms, that's what you're looking for. Because, uh, you know, the problem you're trying to solve is are you ready to go and play and go and compete at the highest level? So the, the only way you can solve that problem then is by getting the training right. And that's where you tend to see a lot of things where just the intensity of the training for, you know, for a variety of different reasons, sometimes just doesn't hit the intensity of what the games are at. And, you know, if I use, I've often used this, we've used this amongst ourselves, myself and Andy, if you look back at... at the Mayo season in 2017, um, as an example, you know, we played nine or 10 games in the championship that year and all everybody kept saying was, you know, 
they're, like, they're going to get tired. They can't keep going. And then I was looking at our, our gang here at Arsenal and the lads, even though the professionals, amateurs, all that, but the lads could play nine or ten games in a month. So uh, across that season, then you're looking to say, right, the lads, you just know they're getting game exposure every week. Um, and then as an example, to, to go and play Dublin in the final that year, we had four games in Crow Park. I think the final was our fifth game in Crow Park in seven weeks. So like you couldn't get better preparation yeah. than that, you know? And it probably, I would say, you know, over that period, it's probably as well as, as the team performed over those. That's couple the best of years. we ever performed. And, and, yeah. and is, is, it, is it your role then in the middle of the week to liaise with the rest of the management team and say, okay, we're eight games in here. We're not doing that much this week during during training. We're not clocking up that many miles. Like, yeah, that, a lot of management. Or is that, or were I you, love that, that kind of, I love a lot of management. Or was I, that kind of, I was pushing a lot of management <laughs> in 2010 before anyone anyway, had heard of it. Yeah, you're just like, and like, I certainly don't have all the answers, like, you know, and, you, you know, the, the longer you coach, the more you realise you don't know and you, you, you yeah. know, you think stuff that was like a cause and effect is not really a, a cause and effect. So, uh, yeah, at that time then, you're just trying to uh, make sure people roll over through the weeks and, and stay fit. But like, the more games they got under the belts, the better conditioning they got because it's yes. just, you're, you know, the pre- pre- preparation is preparing for the exact oh, competition, yeah. you know. Yeah. On, on it, lads, and we'd say, we had a couple of years around maybe 14, 15, 16, I think, where we play a game and I think it was three consecutive seasons with three week windows between every game. So we, we, we won the Leinster Championships, Leinster quarterfinal, three weeks, Leinster semifinal, three weeks, Leinster final. And, and exactly what, what, what Baz is saying there, like, you, you win a game kind of relatively comfortably. You actually want more. You want a, you want a harder test and you want more games because if you're not getting the games week on week like Mayo were at 17, you're just trying to replicate that in training instead. So you're still doing essentially the same load as what Mayo will be doing week on week in competitive championship games, but you're trying to recreate it in internal training games and your training sessions and, and doing extra little bits to try and hit that intensity. So... Like, there is no better way. One, mentally, no, yeah. as, mentally as players, you want to play games. We absolutely despised three-week gaps between games because it meant we were getting flogged for two weeks. Poor dope. Yeah, yeah. uh, hey, and I know it was Jack McCaffrey. Was, um, it was the last year he was talking to Bernal. And yeah. He was, and he was like, I remember drawing with Mayo in 16 and Kerry in 19. And it was like, you come into the dress, so you're mentally deflated anyway, because you felt you should have won the game and you didn't. And then the worst thing, we were all just like, please tell me this replay is on next weekend. Tell me it's next Saturday, six days from now. And they come in, it's like, replays in two weeks. And we're like, no! <laughs> <laughs> like, two replay, more weeks of this. The, the, the replay in 2016 was the 1st of October or something. Was it? October, it was the fourth, yeah. 4th of October, October I think, like, yeah. So yeah. Honestly, you're, you're deflated anyway, because you, you think it's the end of the season and, and like, we're coming... And then we say it's another two weeks, and it's like we know we're gonna have hard training for the next week and things like that. By that stage, you, you do you just kind of want to knock it on the head. Yeah, but one of the well, good news today. The, there's gonna be no more replays till the All Ireland final, so you boys yeah, don't funny, have to worry about that. A funny one there on the 2016 final. One of the the lads who works here with me is American, uh, Shad Forsyth, and Andy has met Shad a few times here, but he's the head of performance here at, at Arsenal and he would have previously worked out in the States with me as well and worked it with the German national team who were involved in a World Cup win with them or whatever. But Shad and his wife, Lila, I got them two tickets for the 2016 final and uh, they came over to it from London. We had a, a we played on the Saturday with Arsenal. They came over on the Sunday. In the and, rain. Uh, that, that yeah. yeah, that yeah. Day. And, and the game finished level and he was like, what do you mean there's a replay? Like, so he's coming from American sports yeah. background. He's like, there's no overtime or no... What do you mean? It's a final and there's no winner. And like, he couldn't, you know, process that. <laughs> We'd have taken but, overtime at that yeah. rate. Just get this <laughs> yeah. done. In the next five minutes, knock this on the head. Oh, yeah, mad, mad when you just have the, the different uh, cultures and how they view those things, you know? But, but yeah. Baz, we're, we're there, right? So myself and Baz go to train at this... Baz is home for a couple of, couple of weeks during the summer and he comes up to train with us and we're, I go to Baz, I said, would you analyze my training session? I'm coaching the boys, so I go up. I thought I'd give an exhibition of coaching up in the pitch, you know. And, uh, <laughs> the, 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 if I do like, say so myself, yeah, if, if I do say so myself, came down, thought Baz would be full of cheer for me, you know. Uh, we sat down here in this famous kitchen. Uh, Baz probably was sitting in this seat and he starts drawing out stuff on paper and he's 
And I'm like, okay, right, what's happening here? And then we go to battle. We went to battle for about 45 minutes. Baz basically telling me <laughs> my training session was absolutely shite. So, so but it, it's funny, Baz. I, I like it is. is. No, but I think there's a lesson in it because my, my, my training session was full of football. So I think it's a, a good thing between a, a football coach and a, 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 a fitness coach and a strength and conditioning coach was my thing was full of football. But Baz was saying, we didn't move in the warm-up. Every one of your drills were not stationary, but they were covering, we might have covered 200 metres in, in, in a, a five-metre block, he was saying. And he goes, you're trying to play a pressing game with high runners because that'd be the team we'd have with high runners. And he said, she didn't prepare the fellas for the match. So it, it, it's a funny one, Baz. Like, what would you be looking for now? A club team, right? So it's November now, but if we just say we're in season. We'll come back to November again. So we're in season. You're here... It was hard to take it. I remember here, it took me 45 minutes to actually take it in. I was like, fuck you, Baz, I was basically saying to him, you know? But, it, it, he, but when I looked, I, I, looked, could, I could tell. I was giving it softly at that stage. I, no, and no. It, I know, it, it took me probably... Carefully, but it probably took me 24 hours to kind of assess it. I didn't sleep at night, to, woke up the next morning, and I said, to be honest, he's probably right. Like, so it, it changed my kind of training, but I was training football, but I, I wasn't thinking about the aerobic side of it. So Baz, mm. mid-season... Football, what should be compiled in a club se- a session or a senior inter county session? What, what would you be looking for? I think that's a roundabout way, Baz. He's trying to poach it from Arsenal for Leitrim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's, he's dancing he's, around the issue. He's there. cheap. He's 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 Leitrim Leit- for Sam, lads. You heard it first here. <laughs> he's cheap. Advisor. Advisor. He's cheap advisor. He's cheap advisor. Yeah, so a club team, I would say, or inter county team as well, is you're, you're, you're looking for training to be as close to, for certain periods, not all the time, because you, you just can't live at the, at, at the high level all the time. Uh, and there are other things more, at some stages of the season, more important than, like, you know, the makeup of a team is, you know, tactical, technical, physical, mental, all those kind of things. And there's a time and a place for all of those things. I think the good teams that do it well blend those things together really well. And if I was to go back to the example Paddy just gave there, now about, like, Dublin not playing as many games as Mayo, Probably the most. Imp- I thought we had an edge on Dublin in 2017 as an example because of the matches we had played. And I remember after the the replayed uh, 17 semi final against Kerry, uh, Dublin played Tyrone the following day in the other semi. Yes, and they just got away at the very beginning of it, you know. And it kind of it just it, it petered out then as it went. Like Tyrone just couldn't get back into it. So I thought to myself, Tyrone couldn't handle the wolf that day. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the wolf. Well, there you go, <laughs> <laughs> that was your favourite game, wasn't it? That was one of your favourite games. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we played so, well. Yeah, I, care, yeah, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I just thought, violent. yeah, I just thought then, like we might have had an edge there, you know, because of, of the exposure we had. But probably the thing that made me more impressed then about Dublin was when the final came along and the pitch of it was probably, I would say, the most physical game I've ever seen. Anyway, because of just the conditions that day, and then the last. 20 or 25 minutes and it was 14 v 14, you know, so there was just a lot of ground to be covered and a lot of athletes, good athletes on the pitch. And for me then, what that showed me was that like Dublin's prep and like, even though they were winning probably their games in the competition at that point relatively easily, their prep behind the scenes and how good their their internal matches must have been were like, would be off the scale for me to to see that they could get up to that level after us having so many championship games under our belt. So, like, the practice really has to mirror the competition at a certain point. Yeah. Uh, so, you, if you, let's say if a team is training three times a week, I would engineer the training where there is a bigger day where, like, people will cover more distance in the session. So, the drills you pick would be obviously related to the way you want to play. You're not just doing drills or play. I would try and do 90% of it with the ball. But I try and organise training. So, like, if you're playing 6v6, you know, there's a difference to that being 6v6 in a 30-metre box and 6v6 in a 90-metre box. They are two entirely different things and what they'll spit out from a physical point of view. So I'd have one session of the week, which would be, you know, kind of big and expansive. Now, I wouldn't go crazy with that in a pre-season from the beginning. You have to get people up through the gears to that. But I'd have one session that's, like, a little a bit bigger on the bigger end of it. I would have a session then that's probably a little bit more intensive that where you would do your tackling work or stuff that has a lot more change of direction in it or small-sided games in a smaller area. You know, small-sided games are not just like 
you, you know, like I, the example I gave there of one been in a 30 meter box and one been in a 90 meter box, they're, they're two different things. So uh, something close together on another night where it's, you know, there's probably a heavier imp uh, implication to contact, change of direction, all that kind of stuff. And then I probably have something then that's a little bit of a hybrid of both where you, you get a mix of what you really need to work on as a coach as well. Uh, and I think if you get those three things kind of built up across a period and really the only thing you start to see, unless people are, you know, if you want to spit out, if you want the session to, to spit out what you're after physically, well, then playing games. Yeah. So putting, the, putting the conditions in the games where, you know, people maybe have to get into a certain area of the pitch or all the people have to be in a certain area to score or, you know, so it's increasing the metres per minute of what people are covering all the time and giving them enough quality rest in between it then so that they can do that and repeat it to a high level. And then obviously the ball handling skills or the kicking skills and tackling and all those things are then, they're at a level of where they're going to be competing against, you know? Yeah. On that, Baz, and I suppose... When GPS came in first to the GAA, I oh, would have been guilty of it. I know we, we spoke about it on the pod before. There wasn't really much education around it for the players or even probably for the coaches at that point. It was just yep. the most yep. obvious thing was, okay, I need to run loads here. If I cover 10K and I've run the most on my GPS stats, that's a positive. That's the, nearly the level it started at. But the benefit of where the, the technology and and that has got to, and the education, and also the coaches coming through, whereas we were able to, I know towards the end of my time with Dublin, exactly what, what, what Baz is talking about, we, we would have internal training games where we could actually measure, we'd have a base and go and say, the 2017 all Ireland fine, we'd have all the stats from that, and you're right, that's arguably one of the most intense games in terms of speed, high speed running, collisions, everything, that, that, that you'll get probably in the last decade of GEA. So that was a baseline for us. And we could measure our internal games to, you know, we could see because we're, our meters per second are way off that level. So we knew what level the absolute peak was and we could see live and training going, we're way off. And, and Are you getting that? Course, are you getting that inside of the pitch? You, you could take that. That's where, where the technology was getting. To. And like I say, from where it started initially and, and you're looking at, it takes the subjectivity out. You could look with your eyes at a, at a training game and say, geez, the lads are flying up there. And the numbers, it could be way off. Just, you might see a collision or it might look like it's a lot quicker than it is. But we could see, oh, lads, we are miles off it. Everyone needs to up this. That's the benefit of where technology and GPS and all that stuff comes in. In a pretty short period of time from like the days of who ran the most, because that yeah. really was, that was yeah. initially, I remember coming in going, how much did I run and going to the underground? We ran 10k, but it's just about, about three times. And going, okay, yeah, 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 100%. You know so I mean? Maybe yeah. it's not really relative to, to performance, but but that's where you can get to, I suppose, where it can really add value, particularly with training and preparation. If you're not getting the 10 games in a summer like Tyrone got in 05 or Mayo got in, in, in 17 that year that you can really measure training. It's really, really measurable. And it's informative to the coaches yeah. and to the players. But I would say, I would say as well, Paddy, that's like, it is the physical element of it is only one part of the training. Yeah. You know, like you can have a team that can, you know, be the most physical team going, but if, if their skill set or their tactical acumen or whatever else might be, or their mental preparation is not up, up to scratch, you know, that's, that's going to, you know, you're not going to, just because you get all perform. those numbers. Yeah, you're not going to match a double well, one or carry out your own, you know. Yeah, so I think that's a big thing to just, to use it in the context of, of what it's needed mm. for. And I think in some cases then, like, people get a little bit lost with it in trying to think, you know, we run more, we're going to win. You know, I think there's actually evidence in soccer with some of the some of the research that's done is actually the less you run, the more you win. Because if, if you have possession, it's the other team that's chasing the ball all the time. So... Um, it, it's it's a tool, you know what I mean, and so, it's it, it, can help a, it can help preparation a lot. But you just need to know how we, to use it. We had a great man in, in Bernard Brogan, and he'd break Cully's heart like he, he'd cover about three k in a match, but he'd score about two six. Yeah, and exactly. I'm there, running, I'm running twelve k beside him. Like, how is this fella doing? And he's just that <laughs> Dean Rock is like it as well. Do you remember You're your right? stats, Andy? I used to ask for one thing, one thing only: how fast did I run? 
because if it used to be so slow sometimes. I used 7.6 to... metres per second. Oh, so slow, Paddy, sometimes. That's the only thing I used to ever, like, our, our s coach. You're preaching to the choir, man. You're preaching yeah. to the choir yeah. here. For, for, for Leitrim is Dahi McCabe, and he rang me during the week. He goes, what used you look for? And I I uh, I go, just my top speed, nothing else. Didn't care about anything else. <laughs> if I was running fast, that means I could get on the ball. <laughs> is, is, this, is this the top speed that you hit or your average speed when you're making no, a sprint? The top, the top speed. Top speed. Would like and what would, it, what would it be? What would your top speed have been? Oh, very slow. Jesus. Uh, 31s, past 32s at most. And, but I could, That's not that bad. What way did you measure I used to just ask for what was the top actual speed. Oh, actual, like, miles per hour. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. What, what, what did I hit? And if I hit a decent one, I was what like, okay. We used to yeah. by uh, meters per second. Second, yeah. It's just the same. It's the exact same calculation, yeah. just expressed yeah. a different way. We, yeah. we had a couple of I want to find out, hold on, I want to find out who was hitting the, the highest fast speed, Paddy right, so, so, or Andy, in the 2017 season. Andy, what were you hitting? <laughs> Gee, lad, Paddy, I, or Tommy, I was ridiculously slow. I was... 31 at most, I'd say, maybe 32. Paddy. So he we, we, we used to measure by metres per second. So what's that by metres per oh, second? Oh, that's... Right? I'd have to get the calculator. <laughs> the calculator. Yeah, no, yeah, we used to go, the fastest yeah, I ever... The fastest I ever broke was 9, nine metres per second. It was like 9.1 or something, which was... And it was actually later in my career. We used Because, yeah. again, you probably weren't measuring as much before... We had a couple of guys who would have broke 10 metres per second, which is... They're pretty quick now, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's... And at the number 10, it's pretty quick for a... Few McCaffrey times. would have got that. Mannion would have got it a few times. Um, who would be like, Paddy, Paddy Small would be like that now. Just like, forget about it. I remember, like, I, told, I think I might have told the story before, like, trying to depress and me and Andy laughing about it. Like, we were absolutely targeted by opposition. <laughs> like, it was like... <laughs> If you get more or Andrews on their own, just go at them. Like. And I remember running after McCaffrey in a training game, and he was actually laughing running by me. Like. He was, as he was soloing the ball, I couldn't even, I was trying to foul him, and I couldn't even like get hands on him to rugby tackle as he's chuckling away, soloing by me with the pitch. So. That, actually, that actually happened to me, Paddy, in a club game. Uh, and I'd, I'd blame Andy fact, for it. Fact, absolute fact. <laughs> yeah. Were you playing wing forward in his side? Yeah. Right. No, it's, it's I, was playing, as you I was playing. I was playing centre forward for Ballard during the league game. I say it was Just hold the middle, Basil. Don't be yeah. gone out to the wings. No 2010 or 2011, it's and Andy was playing. Andy was playing full forward inside me. So we're we're playing. You know, help. Right, so I was jogging up the pitch. You were jogging up into position as we were just about to get started. And Andy runs by me. He goes. Watch this fella here now. I've been out of Ireland for a while. He goes, this book is a right good player, he said. So I went in a He said he's a flyer. Who was it? Only Lee Keegan. Like, I haven't listened well enough to Andy at this stage. Next thing, the ball is thrown in. Lee has gone by the four fellas in the middle of the field and the ball is over the barn. There's 10 <laughs> seconds like gone it. in the game. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in for a long day. <laughs> you never seen like, Andy Legan, I swear oh, to God. He, he just rose to me. Yeah. And uh, the knee half laughing in a full four. Do you know what, lads? It's, always, it's heartbreaking stuff because you're like, particularly whether me and you, Andy, were talking about obviously getting older and coming with your experienced player. And I mean, you're ticking every box. Like you, your diet couldn't be better. You're training, like say, you're living like a monk for 10 months a year. And you're still like, they're still going to burn you with speed. You can't really... Donny, poor old Donny. Donny at the weekend. <laughs> 46 years of age running <laughs> after that young fella. A lot of shambles. Like. I, like, the penalty to win it, though, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, right, he did all right. 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 But, but it's, it's more, that's where you need to know your game. That's where your teammates are around you and getting your kind of team structure right. Like Mayo would have done it very well with you, Andy, kind of nearly protecting mm. you. All joking aside, but we always found it really difficult to get out of your press, even though essentially they're playing with five forwards, like. Five defenders, I call them. One forward. <laughs> five, five defenders and you. But, but that's, it is, it's gas. And I'd say that to players, that, that you can do a hell of a lot younger players. There's certain things that maybe you just, you're not, you're never going to be top of the pops at. But that's where you've got to manage that and you've got to make sure that you're, you're excelling in other aspects of the game. And as Baz is saying, it's one part of the game. We'd all love to be lightning quick. Jesus, I'd, I'd love to think of my career was as fast as Jack McCaffrey. But, but you don't, you need to manage yourself, understand your own game, and your coaches should understand that as well. Yeah, you know, you're sure. And Patty, you develop other qu qualities then as well, like in terms, because well, you don't have them skills, like, you know, so it's kind of, that's, you know, what comes first, you know. Harry, would you have been a fan of the Bronco test? 
done it a few times. Yeah. Because that Diff- bloody... Different versions, different versions of it, yeah. I just got a flashback to the, the start of the pandemic and the Bronco test being sent into the WhatsApp group. And what started going around then was the New Zealand boys had some of their times up, so you were able to test yourself about it. But then the rumours started going out about what the dubs were doing in the Bronco test. I have no idea if any of these numbers were... Were real. The dogs were tra- oh, the dogs weren't training though, were they? What? <laughs> we only started training in July. <laughs> Wasn't around. Yeah, Tyrone weren't training. Either. Paddy, your your numbers didn't come up, but I think it was Kieran Kenny or something that had had. Kenny was always good at them, yeah. At the Bronco, the, yeah. The funny thing with that, like, if I remember <laughs> the first time that came in, when you read it, it doesn't sound that bad. Oh no! Out, out twenty and back forty and back sixty and back low. That should be manageable enough. He kind of set off at a good pace, and I always remember the only. I thought that was the worst we'd ever done. We, we had a number of different ones you done over our career, but I always felt the Bronco was probably the worst. The second, third, and fourth run is carnage. It's a, it's a disgrace. <laughs> like it's, but the fifth one, you're just you're, you're dead anyway. So you kind of just drifted into the end line. But the second, third, and fourth, like think of another three of these runs today. It was catastrophic. You no, did a test with us one time, Baz, in Tullamore. Donny Vaughan nearly dropped dead. He, he ran it that fast. Um, it was unbelievable. Did he, did he stay going? Did he set out fast and kept going for the whole thing? Oh, it, it, he was the, it, wasn't he a freak show, Baz, doing them? Yeah, he was yeah. just... He, he just, could run. I think that he test there, uh, Donny, Donny Vaughan and uh, Paul Cribben that played for Kildare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. What, what was the yeah. test? Uh, they would. Uh, I think we did like a one one k test or a one point two k test, which was like you know, because like ten uh, up and back six, ten times. Well, no, yeah, hundred meter, 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 meter track. So you're up and back five times. You know, so it gets you a thousand meters. So yeah. uh, around the track or the no, no, track. up and back. And, so, and, yeah, and, the, and what was nine, the nine changes the direction? The quickest I've seen are lads that have just scraped in under three minutes. And, who, and is that, who's hitting? Yeah, is that Gaelic football or sitting there? Yeah, I've seen Gaelic football. I'd that. Yeah. Go on, give us a name. Well, I mentioned two of them there. Did you? Yeah, two ago. boys. Yeah, really was, was, was Cribben yeah. army? Is he a cadet? No, he played out Aussie rules with Collingwood yeah, for a while as well. Oh, sorry, and I, was, I believe, if I'm if my memory correct me, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. I believe when he went to Collingwood and started there, he won the fitness test on his arrival there. Wow, all the season pros are one version of them as well. Yeah, so he's like, there's, there's, like, there's always lads who are just savage. Some, really of those, some of those Kildare really boys, good. there was serious athleticism in that Kildare team as well around then. Like they had some savage athletes. In that what team. year was that, Baz? You were Kildare? It would have been 2014. Uh, no, Jason Ryan's the man. Jason Ryan, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I used to hate test lads, but poor old <laughs> Keith Higgins, poor old Zippy. Like he wasn't bad at <laughs> Ah, but he used to be depressed. If you mention, if you mention oh, the fitness God, test, yeah. if, if, Higgins, if Higgins knew there was a fitness test coming on the Saturday, the Tuesday night he trained and he was depressed. The Thursday, <laughs> he, just, <laughs> he was, it was winding him for the week. Like they going. used to, uh, they used to stop telling us they were coming because yeah. if you would, you know what was on, you get a, a WhatsApp in the group or something, and it would ruin your day. <laughs> your whole work day, you're just like, oh yeah. Thing later on, I'm doing a Bronco or there's times you come back after you used to take a break for the club with Dublin in April after the National League and he knew the first week back in May pre-season and Cully would be there and he'd just look I wouldn't even look at him, I just got to go talk to you <laughs> get this thing over and there's always lads in the middle of it I don't know, I can picture you like this and I guarantee you are like this there'll be lads doing the fitness test and the horrible training test and they'll be giving it the big one like Bit of grandstand, like, come on, lads, one more lap and all that. <laughs> I used to not say a word. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't talk to anyone. No encouragement for anyone else. I, I couldn't do it myself because I was out of breath half the time, but I was just head down and just get me through this. End this as quick as possible. But, Hate it. But, Hate but, it. but Baz would tell you there, Paddy, I used to have to psych myself up like as I was going playing at kind of Fine. Yeah. Oh, you know yeah. I mean? yeah. Barry, yeah. Barry you, weren't that, yeah. you weren't that Andy Moran's famous book launch, were you? No, I missed no, no. I it. Was, I was, yeah, I was yeah. talking to Mike below and he'd be able to corroborate this story, but I won't be able to do it justice. So I'm only going to give it a little, a little bit of a teaser here, but Tom Parsons gave an incredible speech that night. Right. And he spoke about his first night in Mayo training. He had a text. Uh, it was in January. Training over in, in such a place. Could have been Swinford. Could have been, I don't know where it was. And Tom was getting picked up by Andy Moore. So Andy swung over to Charleston, pulls up, beep, beep. Tom walks out. Late. 
absolutely late for a late. start. Hops, in, hops into the car. He's like, it's about a half an hour trip to the thing. He's ready to start talking to Andy. Next thing Andy just goes, shh. It's not true. Presses play on the car radio system. Muhammad Ali quotes for the next 30 minutes going over the train. <laughs> <laughs> that is my mind true. can't conceive it. Yeah. And my heart can't believe it. I can achieve it. <laughs> and he was, and Paddy, I swear to God, at the launch, he was hitting out these quotes, you know, from Muhammad Ali. I was like, this is that true? Absolutely Tell didn't happen. Didn't Tell happen. the pod listeners. I believe it. I, 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 uh, I'd have to back into here. I can't see that being true. I don't know. I'd say Tom has been very... Tom been convinced very, me. Uh, Liberal with the truth. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, good. he's good at that too. He's brilliant. But uh, Val, just back to it. I'd like... like Listen, I, I, I suppose my career was finished in 14. Uh, as good as... And luckily enough, you came in that, that summer. We, we went... But I, I, for me, it always kind of identified... Like, we had an excellent SNC coach before you came in with, with Ed Coughlin, but Ed lived in Cork, and it was it, 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 at that stage I needed kind of hands on help, treatment, all that sort of stuff. And you come in, obviously, live a stone's throw away from my house, and we kind of just started working together. Like, to me, I think sometimes the importance of an SNC coach is, is, is mis is, or what an SNC coach is supposed to do is misguided. And people think it's, particularly in Gaelic football, it's about getting big and strong and all this sort of stuff. For me, and you, I suppose, when we worked together, it was totally about injury prevention and keeping me on the field. And uh, I think that part of it is lost. Has that, uh, in Gaelic football compared to professional sport, has that idea became clearer, do you think? Has people got smarter with that? Or do you still think people are looking at bulk and size and whatever, do you know? Um, I, th- I think it just depends because... Uh, that's kind of always the answer when it comes to fitness. It depends. So I'm sorry for saying that. I think it's the first time I said it. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So like, well, I think if you look back at the influence and in, influences in fitness in, in, in GA, I was kind of thinking of it there before I came on. So if you look back, uh, Paddy, I think back in the mid 2000s with Dublin, uh, there would have been a couple of the Leinster lads uh, would have been in doing the SNC with Dublin. I think Dan uh, Tobin was there. Yeah. Sammy Dowling would have been in there yeah. as well. So, like, I think, you know, with rugby becoming professional... The in GAA, that past, the, the time of what was happening in GAA at that moment, yeah, the Northern teams were dominating. So, where yeah. Ma came in and, and mm. Tyrone then, through the mid-noughties, they were bullying teams. And I remember I, my brother Patter was playing in that Dublin team, and then I got to tail end. My first year was Pillars last year in 08. So, that was the, yeah. that cycle of that team. And Dublin would have felt... They lost those games because they were basically beaten up. Like Toronto did it to carry an 3 and all of a sudden the physicality was there. So there was a massive emphasis. If you look at that Dublin team, 05, 06, they were ginormous. Hmm. And, and, but that's where they felt the game was going. Whereas where we are now, you've seen the speed of the game and where Toronto are at and where we got to and where Mayo got to. So uh, it's also, it's what maybe topical at the time and that's where we were definitely a rugby influence there with those guys but that's what Dublin wanted because it was felt that's where we were coming up short against Tyrone and Armagh who were the dominant teams at that time yeah and I think like that was only a natural thing if you were going looking for help you went to the people that were the professionals and you know if you met someone then that maybe you know that's where the sport was going if the manager was going to the to that strength and conditioning coach and the message was like you know the problem we have to solve here is that we need to be bigger and stronger. Well, then you know you go and you get you get bigger and stronger. Whether that's right or wrong, that's you know plenty of teams done it and won. You know, sure. uh, so then probably from if I look at that, that was probably from like you know the late nineties up until maybe 2010, 2011. and then kind of more the athletic potential of teams really the game kind of changed both physically, tactically. Like the game has probably changed more in the last twenty years than it did in the hundred years before. It's so, all like, that would make me very excited as to where it would be like in, in 2030, you know? So if you look at like the 2010 to 2020 kind of bracket of the decade there, like the, just the skill, like, and the level and the pitch that the, the high level games are at now is off the charts to what it was like even 10 years before that. Yeah. And, uh, it's like uh, an example of that for me is if you watch the 2013 final between Mayo and Dublin, and it's basically the same two teams in 2017, but all the lads now are in their mid to late twenties. They've all played for like a number of years, you know, playing in Crow Park. They've all had 
you know, 20 or 30 games there on big days at that stage. And it's like a different sport so when true. you sit down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I watched it, Dur- I'd never seen it before and watched it during the full lockdown. I remember, T- was it TG Carr were doing the games? It was Air and TG Carr, both were, yeah. But we're doing it. And I remember we watched it back. They had it on a Sunday. And I was like, it was garbage for us. Like, compared to, like, like honestly, that was my first all I was like, geez, I'm actually looking forward to sit down and watch this. And it was, a, I feel you're looking at it going, hey, we were off. And now, was, you probably should have won that one. Definitely got the better of us in the first half. And we, yeah, Berno we started gets, really well. Started really well. Yeah. Berno gets a couple of goals. But from our point of view, yeah. we're going, what are we at here? But then, uh, if you look at that game to like four years two, later, yeah, yeah, or even ten years before that, then so what Andy referenced there about like probably a more of an emphasis on people being a bit leaner, being able to get up and down the pitch a bit more. Uh, it's probably a bit more of a tie in then with the, the strength and conditioning, people being on site all the time. So one time, like the S and C person was give the lads a weight program, see them in six weeks. Yeah. You know, that's a lot different now. The person who's doing the, the SNC now with the teams, whether it's in Dublin, Mayo, Tyrone, Kerry, Cork, wherever, all the, the, go, yeah. the county, yeah, all the big counties and a lot of the counties down the line too, you know. Uh, that person is there with the lads four or five nights a week. Uh, in some cases, has more contact with the players than the manager would. So that's then when you get into the example Andy used when you see how lads move in the gym, you see how lads move on the pitch, you realise where they are in the stage of their career. And what you're trying to do then, if you have a, a developmental player, you're trying to slowly introduce them to, you know, an 18, 19, 20, 21 to, to get them up to that level so they get a couple of good years training under their belt. And then the same if you have someone like Andy there who's picked up a couple of injuries. All you're trying to do in that sense is find a square peg for a square hole for what works for those people. And the last thing you want to be doing is, you know, doing the opposite to that where you're kind of loading up young fellas too much, uh, not looking at how they move. And then at the same time, if you're older guys who aren't maybe able for the training load, there's probably that peak crew in the middle or in their in their mid-20s you can handle Anthony throw at them. So um, it's just kind of finding that base where how people move and to be able to, you know, load them appropriately then, both on the pitch and off the pitch. And those two things have to tie in together. You know, if, if you're somebody who's like, doing conditioning with the team or doing speed work with the team, but you've done a heavy leg session in the gym the night before, well, then those two things don't marry up. You know, so it's the it's putting the the week together, the month together, the phase together that you know the the qualities of training that you're trying to improve in the lads that those things are complementary to each other and that you haven't got two things fighting with each other. You know, yeah, makes a lot of sense. I always look at Michael Murphy over the last couple of years. He's like the evolution of man. If you go through the evolution of Michael Murphy, yeah, and he's just literally if you see him now. Compared to where he was when he first came on the scene, he's like a different human being, you know. Well, even I yeah. always thought Paul Flynn's four all stars were one exactly, four, di- yeah. four different body shapes. Yeah. yeah, and if you look at players then that have played, like you know, if you take any of the players now in Division One that would have had exposure to that probably for the goods of a decade, those lads have like anywhere between seven to ten years of good training under their belt, mm. like, and there's just the consistency of that. They just you can't replicate that, you know. There's no quick fix. There's you, you know you do the work, uh, you do it like. Andy and Paddy, when they when they played there for from the own Dublin, they were twelve month of the year athletes. You know, they weren't finishing up playing in September and coming back not ready. Yeah, maybe we'll give you a couple of weeks in the middle of it. But you know what I mean? You weren't turning up like every, every year. You turned up. You were at a higher level than where you started. Yeah, your base, your base, your starting point was much higher. Just keeps moving up, and then the the compounding effect of that over over a couple of seasons, then all of a sudden it doesn't take that much to get you fit once you can stay kind of injury free and you don't pick up any knocks. Baz, uh, Paddy had a line at the, the start of one of these pod, pods back long ago where he goes, you don't come to Dublin training to get fit. You, you're yeah, you're yeah. fit when you arrive and you're there to play football. So I think that kind of ties into what you're kind of saying in, in, that, in that regard. Yeah, and uh, like the first phase of any training that somebody would be going back into in pre-season, the, the goal of that is to get you ready to train, you know, so that you're able for it when you, when you go back and start. And that's, again, in some cases you take... Just a normal person who starts going and do, doing a bit of training, I guess the exercise buzz, they go for a 5K run, they haven't done one in six months, they go for a 5K <laughs> run Monday and decide they'll go for a 5K run on Tuesday. You know, and you're just like, they wonder then why they pull their calf or hurt their back or those kind of things. So it's just... So you just get injured. Yeah, you're just going, it's just a matter of going up through the gears nice and steady and the consistency of that then over a, over a, a long period of time is, is what really gets you the benefits of it, you know? Harry, right, I'm... I've got a Facebook page open here from 2012, Balladrine GA, and it's a player profile. Um, 
Jeez, what's the Where, <laughs> who was the best dressed? The best mm. dressed wasn't Andy Moran. No, the worst, no chance there because Jenny be buying all his clothes. Like so. the, the worst dress wasn't Andy Moran. Uh, Andy does get a mention. I'll come back to that in a second. Oh, he said that your proudest football in moment, and and there's a, a lovely photo you here that I'm going to have on screen when we're doing it, and it's you in the long locks playing for London back in 06. Your <laughs> proudest nice. football in moment, playing Connacht Championship with London. That's now 2012, nine years on. Is that still, when you look back in your, your football days, is that that's still the proudest footballing moment for you? Yeah, I th- well, I think just, no, the, the county titles we'd have picked up with, with Balahadrine along the way then would probably would take over that. But it was just like when you live away from home and the kind of the club team I would have played here with in, in London, say Brendan's, like was basically made up of all St. Mary's students. So the club team was basically three or four lads living in houses together, you know? And uh, we won a couple of championships here in London and uh, ended up winning a trench cup back in Ireland, the only kind of British university team to, to do that at the time. So it was just like just a totally different lifestyle. You know, anyone that went to college in Ireland, they went home at the weekend. Like you basically went playing football at the weekend here in London and just you had a, a mix of all sorts here, really. Like, you know, and uh, it's just a great experience. And to, yeah, the London team now, I still keep in touch with some of the lads that were on that team. And uh, yeah, it's a great experience, you know. You had a couple of decent runs as well back in back in around then, didn't you? How many years did you play for London? Was it was it? I played for two. Seven? Yeah, played play, I played in oh, oh five and oh six. Yeah, okay. Played Roscommon. Played Roscommon in oh five. Oh, you uh, shouldn't have brought it up, Solon. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't I have brought it up. up for that one. So, <laughs> so he, yeah, he, 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 he no, 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 no. Hold on. So, so as we know, it's been mentioned many times in the pod. We live in a small little town, Balladrine, on the border of Roscommon. Mayo. We claim Mayo citizenship. Solons are possibly. The biggest Mio house in the town, right in the middle of the town. And if you knew his mother and father, Jesus, right? So is the pub so, in the house? So all in the yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Together, house, yeah. yeah. So we lived there nearly when we were young kids, right? So we um so Solon has kicked about six spinners against the Rossies, you know? And he, <laughs> he, he, he's done really well. On fire. <laughs> and he's got, he's gone in on the cake one on one. He's, he's gone in on the cake. Now it was a, t- a tough, tough effort. And the cake was brilliant. Like, wasn't he, Baz? He was brilliant. Yeah, cake. yeah. He got and he yeah. Go on, talk us through it, Solon. Of... No, no. That's How it, long is left? How long is left? Uh, that was kind of around the start of the second half. We okay. led the whole way and got picked by a point then in injury time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's it, great. The great memories, even when you bring them up there now to 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 look back on it, it's great crack at the time, you know. We're right. listening. On, we're listening on the radio. I swear to God, it's like old times. It was like you know the Man United Liverpool three three when you were listening <laughs> yeah. on the radio. We were Five listening lines. on the radio, listening to this London game. <laughs> all, we, all we hear is Solon. Solon is in, and it just uh, the cake pulls it out uh, of the bag. But it had been a famous victory. The way the way Andy described it earlier, Barry, you, like. Andy said it was the last minute. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was. In my head, it was. In my I'm head, it was. Happy to hear it was. Happy to hear it was. It was a bit earlier. So, what kind of a footballer were you? Oh, average, really. I'd say. No, and like style-wise, were you were you a dog at half uh, forward? Were you a shooter? Yeah, I'd, I'd be a, probably. I wouldn't. I would definitely wouldn't have the pace of the two lads down below. So I'd be slower than the two of them. So <laughs> I'd, I'd, be all right. <laughs> I'd be all right if I uh, if I got the ball in my hands. But like, yeah, sometimes winning a race to get the ball in your hands could be trouble, you know. So and, Baz went to London. Baz, yeah. I, I, Baz went to London. He was fairly midland and came back from London fairly good. So really? that the, like the evolution went with his training and it it, it kind of took off. And, Jeez, you, you kicked a lot of points for London Baz, I, I think, a championship over the over the couple of years. I think you're being a bit harsh on yourself there. But he was a playmaker, playmaker, left or right half forward, kicking kick all free, wouldn't you, Solon? <laughs> That's right, you don't kick many of them now, but... <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's, he's an injury, he's not telling you about his injury, he's not telling you about his injury, Solon. Played his, oh, trying yeah, to play a bit of soccer, you know? St- staff football game here, 10 days ago, uh, our training ground is next door to Watford's. So we play them in a staff game every so often, you know. And I raced out of a meeting. I would dodge your left ankle, but uh, <laughs> raced out of a meeting, forgot to tape it and busted it. So, yeah, oh, hobbling, no. around, hobbling around the place the last two days. He'd one of these, days. Patrick. He'd one of these, Patty. <laughs> had a few of them myself. Yeah. I was getting the curly finger off Jim, so I had to pretend you were injured. <laughs> oh, the old hammer. The old hammer is after tightening up there. Good of a knock. I was like, yeah, right. Geez. I got a knock in the 17th final, actually. got whipped off. <laughs> Did you turn off the 13th final after you came off? 
Yeah, I knew the results. I knew we wanted him, yeah. Because, do you know, do you, do you notice, do you ever notice what happens there? You're coming off the field and Moran gets the ball and puts it in the back of the net. It's, it's a bit of... I was, hey, was the there. truth about it is I was coming off myself when he put it in the back of the net. <laughs> if you see Horn's reaction, I was on the way myself, so we, we should have went off together. Yeah, I remember, do you know what I do remember for that? I remember sitting on the bench the last for about 15 minutes or so and it was a war zone, wasn't it, that game? Yeah, yeah. We'd made our chains, I think O'Gara, O'Gara tore his hamstring Johnny Cooper and Rory O'Carroll had a couple of bangs in the head. It was just, but you know, it was the start of what would be the next five or six years. And every time Dublin and Mayo played, Jesus Christ, it was, uh, it was yeah. full on. Yeah. Back to the mess. Uh, that's why everyone loved the games. Like, the players and the, and the supporters and everyone who watched them. They were just special games, um, special times for, for both teams, you know. Barry, I, can I can I follow up on the proudest moment in a football jersey? What's been your proudest moment in your professional career so far? Jeez, that's a good question. Because um, you've been there for some incredible moments in the last decade. Yeah, I'd say I probably did. Well, I just think the the GA experience, like with Mayo, like it's just you you can't get that anywhere else, you know. So like, you know, I don't there won't be a team I'll coach again where two of my best mates are on the team with, with Andy and David there, you know, and that's just a unique experience. My family or friends, they were all involved in that. Um, people's wives, girlfriends, everyone, you know. So, yeah, it's just a great experience there to do with your, with your, with your home county, like, you know, and you can tell from listening to, to the lads there the last, uh, the, the last couple of months here on the podcast and all the guests you've had on, I feel like a bit of an imposter here now with, like, the quality of people you have on in terms of all Stop. Ireland medals and all that. But, like, but yeah, just, I like, feel strolling and I'm here. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I always say best set an author now. Like, yeah. Myself and Paddy have two seven between us. No <laughs> best <laughs> boys for literature from all in there next year now. You yeah. So the Mayo one was just very enjoyable, you know, very yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about that seventeen season because um, it, it does shine through from listening to Andy. Like the there was something special going on that that year, and I suppose it, it wasn't only the ten games that you had. Some things just clicked in the background as well as as on the pitch. Oh, yeah, it's just, and I think as well, like the lads were running for a good while at that stage, so they all knew each other fairly well. You know, the team was up and running four or five years before I ever got involved in it. You know, so yeah. I wouldn't say it was anything I done special in 2017 that you know had the lads who had the world. They were out and competing for the guts of a decade at that stage before I had kind of got in near them. So um, they're just yeah, great bunch and great memories. Like the, the stuff I would take out of it is like the matches and all that stuff is great, but just the crack you have. You know, yeah. and like nights out and different things would have happened on, on training camps and trips down to Portugal and other different bits and pieces that happened there. We never went to there. Portugal, lads. Everyone giving out the weed. I mean, you lads heading off to Portugal. Jesus. <laughs> this is your London fundraiser tomorrow, is it? That you're heading this off. Is it, off. This is it. This is it. There's money in my old paddy, but just not as much really? as you. Jeez, yeah, yeah. We, we, just, we just have to earn all ours. <laughs> 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 He's been waiting 28 weeks to put that Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he's thrown a few of them in there before. The no, it's usually Tommy, to be fair to me, Paddy. I think that's my first one. He's his mead hat on. I haven't mentioned like, mead. I haven't, I haven't mentioned mead once this week. Anyway. Barry, um, are we allowed to mention you're, you're working on something at the minute that's uh, that's been in the pipeline for a wee while? Are we allowed to mention the, the app that's coming down the line? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's uh, basically since the start of the lockdown uh, last year, we kind of had all these difficulties in, in, in getting training programs out to people. Um, so myself and Connor Finn, who's uh, involved with me at there, Connor was involved with me along with my own, has been coaching the lads there for the last uh, four or five years as well. So we've just uh, built an app across all the sports that has basically... If you're a club player or uh, you know a player just below the level of, of being elite or somebody who wants to get a good training program or whatever it might be across any sports we have a load of coaches lined up to be on the app who'll be able to provide programs for GA pre-season in-season strength power whatever you need the same across rugby Gaelic football so it's kind of first in class in that kind of kind of range so uh, we're very excited about it it's put a lot of work into it now over the last uh, 18 months so it's just kind of getting ready to launch there now at the minute so it's just a place where people can come and, and get good advice the same as you mentioned at the, at the start of the show there a bit like you know me going to the mechanic and not knowing what he's going to tell me the, the app is kind of just designed where people can come in and get you know a program off a trusted high quality coach that they know they're going to be looked after and that it's going to be specific for what they want for themselves and for the sport you know 
class. And are you saying type lift on a name or you watch this? Oh, no, yeah. So it's, it's called Podium, P O D 1 U M. So the podium.com is the website there, and people can have a little look. There's a, a sign up list there waiting for people before we have it, have it ready to launch. Yeah. Brilliant. Right. Well, best of luck yeah. with that. Um, very much. It's been fantastic having you on the pod. I know the two boys are keen to get you on over the last little while. Is there anything you want to leave Barry with before we wrap up? We've kept them long enough. Typical of us, we've gone over time this week on the football pod. Let him get back to bed there. <laughs> Warren's heading off to another book lounge there now for 10 o'clock. <laughs> Assignment. Okay. You're going, you're, yeah, you're, I'd rather be what I'm at. You're going wedding planning, kids. Um, I think that call is still going on. Hey, had a wedding Zoom before we start, and he has one scheduled for just after as well. The, the big you question is, Roddy Collins going to the wedding? Got to do another video, I think. <laughs> 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 is he taking over United is the bigger question. I've seen a picture His of him. His hands are tied. Oh, Three Louis really Copeland suits for all the United lads. <laughs> oh, my God. DR7 would be the Louis Copeland ambassador with Roddy. Barry Tolan, top class. Great to have you along this week. Thanks a million for joining us on the football pod. Lads, thanks a million for having me. Thanks, Baz. Baza, Baza. <laughs> Enjoy the weekend. Good luck. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back to episode 28 of the football pod of Paddy Landy. Barry Tolan, what a phenomenal guest that we had on this week. What a wealth of knowledge that man has. Andy, you spoke about him in a, in a way saving your career back in 2014. And uh, I can only imagine you've spoken before about the influence that Barry had. Uh, by the way, in that player profile back in, in 2012, I meant to say it to him, Barry Solon had you down as one of his biggest influences alongside John O'Mahony. So, uh, shit, I, sh- I should have asked him about that. I was just laughing there. He, uh, he saved Andy's career in 2014. He saved my life about three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> what a man. He can do it all. He can do it all. Uh, Fantastic. Right, you, you heard uh, <laughs> Paddy Andrews calling it a... Uh, what did you say? It was a disgrace, did you? He was talking uh, about the Manchester United situation at Man United. Let's just make it clear. This is an evolving situation. So as people are listening to the podcast now, they could be losing to Villarreal right now. They could be beating them with the could be yeah, with could the be caretaker out. coach, Michael Carrick, before the interim is appointed, before the manager is appointed. Paddy Andrews, who do you want to be the next Manchester United manager? Roddy. <laughs> no, I, do you know what I, I, I just think and a, a lot of people are saying this everyone knew this fella was out the gap really from the Liverpool game Wright was on the wall probably starting the creek yeah. Leicester which is probably 4-2 or Leicester maybe 7 weeks ago the Liverpool games a shambles City game the week after every bit is bad and they've had that, that's 4 or 5 weeks ago so, like, what have they been doing in, in that period of time where there was no way this fella steadied the ship, which was great, obviously, yes. but that's the level he's at. That was it. To go to the next stage, look at what Chelsea did. Lampard did a job for you, and then, okay, thanks for that, but we're trying to win. Go to the next level. We need an elite coach. Good luck. Ruthless. But that's mm. the way it is, like. And you know, what? like, hanging on, six weeks this has been going on, they know this fella's going to be gone. They announced the second after Saturday. I was actually just laughing watching the game on Saturday. It was that bad. Everyone knew he was gone. And he came up the next day. An interim for the interim for the coach at the end of the season. What, what has the board or Ed Wood or these guys been at for the last six weeks? Like? And they're getting away with it, Scott Free. It's laughing. Carrick is in some, He's been part of the coaching team. That was a shambles. Like. It's... Incredible that an organization that big, that size, with that much money at their disposal, and the time they've had to, to get their ducks in order, that this is the best they've been looking. Carrick for what, a month until they get another interim. It's laughable. You've you both you've both spent much of your playing days as part of highly functioning, high performance cultures. You have like what is it what do you what sort of a sense do you get of the culture at Manchester United when you look at the players? No leadership and there's no planning. There's no planning whatsoever. And this shows them. What? There's no strategy, no plan. They didn't have the stones to make the hard decision. Really possibly could have bombed them out after losing to Villarreal last year in the Open League finals. Go, right, we're going to go in a different direction here now. And they were still trying to hold on that he just scraped through to the end of the season. Even what about- though everyone could see that this was... What about the players, though? Do you put any blame in, in that direction? Their, their performances this year have been so below par. Yes. So below par. 
Apologies. I tell you, I was thinking the worst I could have done was apologise after I missed that penalty four times against David Clark. And I couldn't even take it in at that point. But that's the, the, every week it's an apology. Like, what? Just go do it on the pitch. Yeah, it's funny, but Cavani and Ronaldo, there's no apologies out of them two boys. They're just going in, do the business. Turn, like they're 70 between the two of them. And they're, you know, they're. That's like, what are you two between the two of you? Are you 70 as well? I'd say we're close. I'm young I know, yeah, but I I'm, know. An, I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 uh, Slightly way in Ronaldo's Yeah, so it's just. Uh, you just don't see any. You, you don't see any um, apologies from them because they're just going to do the business and they score goals. They, they try hard and away they go, and it's it's uh, it's amazing. But I I just lads, I I just get caught up. I can't go on Twitter because I was never a United fan, right? Closet you know, Ronaldo fan, but uh, never a United fan. But I'm just obsessed with Roy Keane. <laughs> oh yeah, I, can't, I put it on the WhatsApp earlier. He's box office, isn't he? Yeah. So we, I was up early this morning for work, and I was just there. I, uh, now we're two to kill between classes early this morning. I was thinking I, that. I was wondering, like, he's up very early this morning. Yeah, I, I was just, I was just watching Roy Keane clips. Of him just, <laughs> it's just flat out. It's flat out. Like. But everything he said, everything he said. Like he's, not, like he's not a football genius or anything like that. I think it was proven with his managerial, which he did well, okay, but not brilliant. Yeah, he did okay, but like everything he said would happen. Yeah, it literally just happened. Like I know you didn't have to be wrong, but he just goes, the culture is wrong. There's no leadership. Players here, I'm De Gea, bad. Maguire. It's, he's unbelievable. But you know, he was spot on, and this is where we're chatting with Baz earlier on. You probably you need to have a bit of politics and a bit of nuance behind you to go in he's not going to be the manager but for an example of him to do that and there was a great article on him yesterday in the Times with David Walsh I'm not sure if you've seen it mm. and he basically said this that he feels he won't be a manager because he won't play those games there's no agenda and ultimately if you're going in in a leadership role or a manager you've got to deal with those 25 personalities yeah. and then you've got to manage up you've got to deal with Woodward and these Muppets as well like, and he's just not going to do that and that's, that's just his personality whereas does he have the knowledge to, to add value? Of course he does. Like I say, he's just said it all. But you've got to have a little bit more along with you today, I think, that those players, I, I couldn't deal with it. Like it's, we're talking about it, egos and stuff like that, trying to get the best out. But that's part of coaching, and coaching modern day. And mm. I'd say there's a bit of a GA as well. <laughs> Not just the soccer lads, but it's, it's a mess. And it's a mess of our own making. And it, yeah. it, it, seems, it seems like at every turn... They're tripping themselves up again and again. It's the same mistakes, the same errors. It's not going. It's not going to change anything soon either. Have you any trips to Old Trafford planned in the next couple of weeks or months? Or are you going to hold off on them for a wee while? We're trying to get married first and get through the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> We're going honeymoon to Manchester. Yeah. You, you have I a big over the new year. I go you, over the new year. You have a big couple of weeks ahead of you, and Andy Moore, and you have a big few weeks ahead of you as well. Training is going to be allowed to commence soon for inter county teams, and then. You got the big news this week that there's going to be pre-season competitions back. We've gone back to the future to 2017. Couldn't get proposal B over the line, but boy, we've got the McKenna Cup and the FBD League and the O'Byrne Cup back. But it must be good news for you as no, an Ireland commander. Go on, Where, or, 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 if you win the FBD League, you get a trip to the States still. No, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Uh, New York. No, New York. Only thing keeping it going. New but York, baby. The, the, uh, the like, obviously. Leitrim wanted to propose a B come through, but the yeah. fact that it didn't come through, it's really good news that the, the divisional leagues are back because you were going to go have to fish for challenge matches anyway. So yeah. at least it gives you the, a structure, proper match, getting ready for a Sunday and getting prepared for the league. So if the league was going to go as, as, as it always was, it's good news that if the FPD comes back, it's good news for us. You don't have your draw or anything like that yet, do you? For the league? No, for the, for the FPD. No, not for that. We don't know who you're going to be playing first yet. Okay, okay. We're going to be waiting with a bit of breath. Yeah, yeah. Castle Bar. Man, yeah. No. Paddy, we, might have to, we might have to do a special pod. Okay. Um, lads, thank you very much for joining me this week on the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. Um, it's been brilliant. It's been great fun. You had your buddy Baz, Barry Solon on as well. So uh, Barry was, was great company there for the last hour as well. I hope everyone at home has enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please do make sure you're subscribed. The 2022 season is only around the corner. There's going to be plenty coming for you from, from this podcast uh, in 2022. So we're going to see you again very, very soon. Paddy Andrews, thank you. Thank you. Andy Moore, and thanks. We'll see you next week. See you next week, lads. Good night, Chance.